The UK is crisscrossed by a network of tens of thousands of high voltage electricity pylons. But did you know that along the top of these towers runs an earth wire, to which a fibre optic cable is often attached? The fibre optic network was used for providing part of what is known as the National Electronic Data Network, and later another use was discovered. More on that soon. There were two main companies that ran fibre optic networks, Energis and Cable and Wireless. Energis began as Telecom Electric, later became Energis Communications Limited, which was then acquired by Cable and Wireless before Cable and Wireless was acquired by Vodafone. Energis's national optical fibre network was partially installed on the country's overhead power transmission lines. The fibre cables were initially wrapped around existing ground wires and were later redesigned so that the optical fibre formed the core of the wire itself. This cable network gave rise to a sleeping giant poised to light up the UK telecommunications market. There's lots to discuss, so let's start at the beginning. Known as Telecom Electric briefly, before becoming Energis Communications Limited, Energis was a telecommunications company based in the UK and formed in July 1992. The national grid kept its plans secret for months before seeking permission from Trade Secretary Michael Heseltine to set up a new company called Telecom Electric on the 8th of May 1992. It was founded as Telecom Electric by way of a demerger from the UK's National Grid Company and its aim to lure customers and key staff away from BT and Mercury. It was later rebranded as Energis Communications Limited, shortened to Energis. The government privatised British Telecom in November 1984, throwing the doors wide open to competitors. The world's first personal communications network was set up straight away, and when Energis came along, it was already well established in the UK, and run by Mercury Communications Limited, in partnership with US West Incorporated. It was called Mercury Communications, and was the first major competitor to challenge BT's monopoly on telephone services in the UK. Basically, it was a major threat to BT. It was the launch of Energis that at that time potentially represented a bigger threat to BT than Mercury ever could. In fact, it represented a major threat to Mercury as well. BT said it welcomed competition from other companies. Little did they know that Energis had been quietly investing £250 million stringing fibre optic cables between the electrical pylons that made up the national grid. Why would another trunk telephone network pose such a threat to the established order? Well, it was now the UK's third major telecoms provider, and it had a big advantage. The cost of building its network was dramatically lower than it was for any other competitor that had to bury its cables. Once strung with fibre optic cable, the national grid represented a completely ready-made trunk network that would cover the country at a fraction of the cost that Mercury's network took to build. The company anticipated strong growth in corporate data networks, but it didn't expect the spectacular growth that occurred during the rest of the decade in corporate internets and intranets, call centres and the huge volume of data that companies would be transmitting to manage and run their businesses. By mid-1994, most of Energis's national telecommunications network had been constructed. Within 19 months of starting construction, it was able to bring its first services to the market. At this time, there was a lot of debate and discussion regarding their fibre installation. The National Grid and Energis believed that they had compulsory powers under the Electricity Act 1989. The argument was considered correct for where the fibre optic was used in connection with monitoring the electricity network. Where the fibre optic was used for the electronic data network, this was found to be a communications cable and was covered by the Telecommunications Act. As they didn't have powers under that legislation, they had to agree terms with land and property owners for the right to install and maintain the fibre optic lines. Energis had a nationwide agreed fixed rate for equipment held on an annual basis. Many of these agreements were for fixed periods of 10 or 15 years. It was possible to agree longer terms, even permanent easements for which enhanced rates were payable. From the outset in 1993, farmers were already up in arms about the rollout of Energis. Why? Well, the cables crossed their land, and they recognised an opportunity to market the valuable commodity of the fresh air above their fields. Representatives of the NFU and the Country Landowners Association struck a deal with Energis that meant they would receive payments where cables crossed their land. 
Payments range from £6.50 a year per pole to £20 a year per pylon, with an allowance of £2 per year where cables cross their land, but pylons were on adjacent land owned by somebody else. By 1994, farmers were paid up to £3.50 per metre of cable. This led to a deal with Mercury, in which they were also paid for the installation of underground cables on their land at £5 per metre for the first duct laid, and £1 per metre for any further ducts, along with a location payment to the landowner of £76. The Energis deal was made on the basis that the cable was for the exclusive use of Energis, and only messages for the national grid would be carried. In 1998, Energis told farmers that they would let out the cable to any company, and as a result, their share price rocketed. Farmers felt that they should get a share of this because the original payment was negotiated on the basis that the cable was for in-house use. However, a spokesman for the National Grid said this didn't constitute an upgrade of the equipment and that the deal would remain the same. Things got very petty and very silly too. The Energis deal with farmers was for a 24-strand cable, so when 36-strand cables were proposed, all hell broke loose, and they felt they should receive greater payments. It was even reported that farmers started shooting the fibre-optic cables on the pylons with shotguns because they wanted higher payments. Naturally, the pylons were fitted with signs to inform residents of the upcoming fibre line installations, but on one instance in Northwood, they were located so high that nobody could read them. A doctor was out walking his dog when he noticed a sign over 30 feet up the side of a pylon. He went home, got his binoculars, and when he viewed the sign he could just about read it. Funnily enough, it was put up to let residents know where to file any objections, which Energis was legally obliged to do. At the time of its initial rollout in September 1994, Energis began targeting businesses and high-use residential customers, claiming it could save them 40% on their daytime phone bills. It claimed to be a minimum of 10% cheaper than BT and Mercury, and 15% cheaper at weekends. Even before it completed its core network, it won its cornerstone contract with the BBC, which went on to rely on the network to distribute its analogue and digital TV and radio output. The relationship between the two, which began in mid-1993, was extended to include all of the BBC's telecommunications, hosting and internet connectivity. Before the £100 million 10-year deal, the BBC used BT to operate a managed broadcast network on its behalf, linking facilities including studios and programme production centres to its transmitters. The energy system ate up a large chunk of BT microwave links, landlines and private lines across the UK. Towers like Heaton Park in Manchester were used to carry these sorts of signals before Energis took over. In 1995, Energis launched its own phone card. It allowed customers to make calls from more than 48 countries using a free phone access number. It offered three levels of service from Base Caller, providing a speed dial link with just one number, to World Caller, which operated on a pin and provided a full range of services. All cards enabled users to use a messaging facility if a number was unavailable, where the unobtainable number was continually redialed and a message left. Users didn't need a home phone to apply for a card, and charges were between 7 and 27% cheaper than comparable BT services. They also ran a pilot scheme called Call 43, as in Call for Free, where free telephone calls were provided to users who agreed to listen to an advertisement before a call started. It was aimed at students and those on a tighter budget. Trials of the service included adverts for books by Bill Bryson. Energis turned to Nortel to provide DMS telephone exchanges as well as the design, installation and maintenance for an early form of DWDM or Dense Wavelength Division Multiplexing Technology. Basically, this enabled them to get much more bandwidth out of their fibre lines by using multiple wavelengths, ideal for Energis's plans to offer multimedia and educational services, home shopping and video on demand. In December 1997, Energis became a public company, with shares trading on the London Stock Exchange and the Nasdaq. Net proceeds from the flotation were approximately £200 million. The company used the proceeds to reduce its debt to the national grid. It also capitalised £190 million of intercompany loans from the national grid and issued £60 million worth of convertible preferred shares to the national grid. 
On the 31st of March 1998, the end of Energis's first fiscal year, the convertible preferred shares owned by the National Grid were worth £1.6 billion if fully converted. They reported a turnover or revenue of £167.9 million for the first fiscal year as a public company, ending March 31, 1998. That compared to revenue of £97.1 million for the 1996-1997 period, £42.8 million for the 1995-1996 period and £4.6 million for the 1994-1995 period. From 1997 to 1998, Basic Telephony contributed £99.9 million, a 67% increase over the previous year, while revenue from advanced services increased by 82.4% to £68 million. There is a reason I'm mentioning all this boring financial stuff, which will become clear soon. During its life, Energis acquired a number of companies in the United Kingdom and Europe, Planet Online and Izion AG to name just two. At its height, its market capitalisation was over £10 billion, making it one of the largest companies by market capital. However, in the process, the company overextended itself with borrowings to fund these acquisitions. By the end of its first fiscal year, as a public company, Energis's national network stretched over 5,000 kilometres. It was built primarily across the national grid's electricity transmission infrastructure as well as along the main distribution lines of some regular electricity companies and through the London Underground. Through a capacity sharing agreement with Scottish Telecom, Energis was able to serve its customers in Scotland. The company secured an international facilities licence in December 1996 and owned capacity in 11 submarine cables. Energis also established correspondent relationships with major overseas telecommunications operators to deliver traffic abroad and to carry their traffic back to the United Kingdom. In August 1998, Energis acquired as a subsidiary Planet Online from Paul Sykes for £85 million. Planet worked with Energis to help Dixons launch the FreeServe internet service provider in 1998. Energis provided the telephony services and Planet Online provided the email and internet access. FreeServe didn't have any registration fees or monthly or hourly charges initially. Customers also received unlimited free email addresses, free storage space to design web pages and daily content in the form of news, sports and weather reports. Energis was already carrying 40% of the UK's national internet traffic and Planet Online had 15,000 websites. Within two months of its launch, 475,000 people had signed up to FreeServe, making it the fastest growing internet service in the market. Energis called in Sensonet to measure strain on a selection of fibres which formed the backbone of the network infrastructure. This was the first time the cables were used to monitor the health of the network itself. Sensonet's unique fibre optic technology was used to run accurate health checks on the condition of Energis's cables. They wanted an accurate assessment of the health of the cables following a number of years exposure to the wind and the weather and to ascertain whether any of the cables were approaching the industry's guideline figure of 2000 microstrain or 0.2% as the limit for long term strain on installed fibre. Sensonet's distributed temperature and strain sensor or DTSS equipment successfully measured the strain on a total of 212 kilometers of telecommunications fiber and provided that 97% of all measured fiber was strained to less than 1000 microstrain and that no fiber was strained beyond 1350. They also measured the full brillion spectrum of light at every meter along the fibre, with real-time analysis enabling both the strain and temperature to be calculated independently at all points. This gave Energis confirmation of the integrity of its strategic fibre optic network. Energis was demerged from the National Grid in 1997. In January 1999, the National Grid announced plans to cash in on the popularity of telecom stocks by cashing in £1.2 billion plus of its stake in Energis. It effectively reduced its holding from 74% to just under half. By 2002, it owned a one-third stake in Energis and put it up for sale in January. In late 2001, investors were given a stark reminder of the difficulties of investing in the alternative telecom market when Energis lost a tenth of its market value just because one of its customers said it was reviewing its contract. 
FreeServe announced that it was considering using another company to provide telecom services for its metered internet access product. The contract, which was due to expire in 2003, was generating around 6% of Energis's revenues by 2001. Energis attempted to play down the significance of FreeServe's move, saying that it was just a technical point in a renegotiation and that it coincided with the shift towards unmetered internet access packages. Needless to say, FreeServe stayed put for now, but the writing was starting to appear on the wall for Energis. In 2002, they renegotiated a two-year extension deal with FreeServe. A 22% slide in Energis's shares in January 2002 meant that the group's value had fallen to £313 million. It announced that it would miss its financial targets that year and was in danger of breaching banking covenants on its £725 million banking facilities. The group also had a bonds issue, taking its net debt to more than £1 billion. In July 2002, Energis was effectively taken over by its banks. The company's share value was just a fraction of its peak in 2000, and speculation that Energis could be broken up was rife after a company spokesman confirmed that takeover approaches had been received, though none for the company as a whole. Ultimately, Energis PLC was placed into administration in July 2002, with its operations in the UK immediately being transferred to Energis Communications Limited, a wholly owned subsidiary of a new holding company owned by the banks and known as Chellis. In November 2002, the Izion parts of the Energis Group were sold onto NDO, while the remainder, mostly made up of Planet Online, continued as Energis Communications Limited until August 2005. FreeServe was merged into the Wanadu Group. It then became a subsidiary of France Telecom, who owned a controlling interest in Wanadu. Wanadu rebranded over time and eventually became Orange Home UK. Since the merger of Orange UK into EE, Orange Home UK was integrated into EE's range of services. Cable and Wireless clinched the takeover of Energis in a £594 million deal in 2005. The bid was accepted by a binding majority of Energis's debt holders, and the company became part of Cable and Wireless on the 11th of November. Cable and Wireless warned that the combination of the two businesses would result in the loss of 700 jobs by March 2008, as it looked for £80 million of annual savings. Many employees had signed up to ShareServe, also known as Save As You Earn, SAYE, or the Savings Related Share Option Scheme. It was designed to encourage employees to buy stakes in the companies for which they work. Early Energis employees got a preferential rate, and some were planning to retire potentially very wealthy. They'd amassed a small fortune in shares before the stock value of Energis crashed, and many employees were therefore extremely badly affected. If you walk around London and other major cities today, you may find the legacy of Energis under your feet. Of course, looking skyward is perhaps a bigger reminder of the UK's first pylon-mounted fibre optic network.